December 2nd, 1942, an event took place that was to change the world for all time to come. In a squash court under the west stands of Stagg Field at the University of Chicago, the atomic age was born. On that day, for the first time since the world began, controlled production of energy from the atom was accomplished. Mankind had found an answer to a dream as old as man himself. A giant of limitless power at man's command. And where was it that science found the giant? In the atom, a particle so infinitely small that it takes over a hundred million billion atoms to make up the head of a pin. Just as other millions and quadrillions of atoms are the tiny building blocks which make up everything in the world. Ships and shoes and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. Although no one has ever seen an atom, scientists have learned a great deal about how they behave. And there are widely accepted theories as to what they are like. Let's start by meeting a leading authority on the subject, Dr. Atom. Now, observing the professor himself, we can see that his structure resembles in many ways something almost as vast as the atom is small, the solar system, and there are certain similarities. Here, the sun is the center, and the planets revolve around it, while here, the nucleus is the center, with electrons in surrounding orbits. But whereas the planet's movement is like this, neat, orderly, and predictable, the movement of electrons is different. There are other differences, too. Now, the solar system is held together by gravitation, while the force holding the atom together is electrical. The orbital electrons, which are negative, are attracted by the protons of the nucleus, which are positive, and vice versa. But here in the nucleus are other particles with no electrical charges called neutrons. Equally important when it comes to atomic energy are other particles which make up the atom's binding force. It's a kind of cosmic glue holding the nucleus together. This, then, is a single atom, but certainly not all atoms are alike. There are in nature more than 90 basic elements, which is the scientist term for families of atoms. Artificially produced elements which exist in some cases for only millionths of a second bring the number of known elements to more than 100. To scientists, the atoms of the individual atom families or elements are identified by number. That is, the number of protons or positive charges in their nucleus. And they vary all the way from hydrogen, which has just one proton, to oxygen with eight protons, to gold, he's rich with 79. Finally, on to the heaviest of all naturally occurring elements, uranium, with 92 protons. Now, within each element or family of atoms, there can be different members, each one having the same number of protons, but differing in the number of neutrons. The total of an atom's protons and neutrons establishes its atomic weight. Thus, in natural uranium, we have U-234, U-235, and U-238. These different members of the same element or atom family, scientists call isotopes. Some elements, tin for instance, have a great many naturally occurring isotopes. Others, like aluminum, are lone wolves, with just one occurring in nature. Now, most atoms of most elements are content with their lot in life. We speak of them as being stable. But others are busy day and night, being what science calls radioactive. Like radium, for example, throwing off powerful rays, along with some of its neutrons and protons, as alpha particles, until it actually alters its own nuclear structure and changes to another family then to another, until it does convert to a stable form at last. 
this spontaneous changing of elements is called natural transmutation. Its discovery gave men of science an idea. If an atom could change itself, why couldn't man change an atom? Using as bullets the very alpha particles which radium threw off, a noted British scientist bombarded nitrogen and converted it to oxygen. In terms of individual atoms, this is what happened. The radium nucleus threw off an alpha particle consisting of two protons and two neutrons. One of the protons was absorbed into the nitrogen nucleus, turning it to oxygen. This was artificial transmutation, man changing the elements. From that first experiment, others by the thousands followed as scientists devised ever more powerful particle accelerators, commonly called atom smashers, to transmute more and more kinds of atoms. All scientifically important, but hardly world-shaking. Then, in 1939, some scientists were experimenting with the transmutation of uranium. What would happen, they wondered, if they fired a neutron at a uranium nucleus, already the heaviest in nature? Why not try? So they tried. And the results? Nuclear fission. Instead of a minor change, the atom split in two. Truly a discovery to change the world. For what had happened when the uranium atom split was a kind of double miracle of science. Half of the miracle concerned that binding force we spoke of before. That kind of cosmic glue which holds the atom's nucleus together. We still don't know all about that binding force yet, but we do know it's equivalent to mass. Therefore, we may speak of it as having a kind of weight of its own. Now, the two atoms into which a uranium atom splits also have binding force. But for some reason, it takes less of that glue to hold them together. And in the process of fission, a tiny fraction is left over. What happens to it? It's released as energy, proving Einstein's theory that mass and energy are really equivalent. But we spoke of a double miracle. To understand that second one, let's slow down that fission a million or so times. A single particle starts the reaction, splitting the uranium atom. Here now is the release of energy as heat and radiation. Here are powerful rays being given off similar to X-rays. But here are free neutrons driven out with tremendous speed. If sufficient U-235 is present, what science calls a critical mass, those neutrons bombard other uranium atoms, causing them to split and split still others. The result? Billions of atoms release a portion of their binding energy. It would take 36 million pounds of coal to equal the energy released in the complete fission of an amount of U-235 the size of a baseball. Today the world harnesses this energy, released slowly and with complete safety over a long period of time in what might be called the furnace of atomic energy, the nuclear reactor. One type of reactor has a structure or pile of graphite blocks. In the reactor are placed rods of natural uranium containing both U-235 and U-238. As U-235 begins to fission, the graphite slows down the free neutrons and some of them hit other U-235 atoms, keeping the chain reaction going. But others of those slowed down neutrons hit U-238 atoms, and here's what happens. Remember, U-238 differs from U-235 in that it does not fission. However, it will capture neutrons from U-235 fission and start a process which converts the U-238 first to neptunium, then to plutonium. And plutonium will fission in chain reaction. Thus, this type of reactor itself becomes a source of atomic fuel. But nuclear reactors also make possible other very important uses of the energy in the atom. Remember the chain reaction process in a reactor 
produces a tremendous heat, which scientists have learned to control and safely put such fission reactions to work. In a conventional boiler, coal, oil, or gas provide the heat needed. In a nuclear plant, the heat of fission replaces the coal, oil, or gas, boiling the water. which produces steam to turn the turbine, which is connected to a generator. When you realize a pound of nuclear fuel can produce as much heat as two and a half million pounds of coal, the savings and convenience are easily recognized. Today, the most important use of heat from nuclear fission is for the production of electric power. Large nuclear power stations like Dresden near Chicago operating since 1959 and providing enough electricity to meet the daily needs of over a quarter of a million people. Nuclear power plants like Big Rock Point in northern Michigan, Yankee in western Massachusetts, Humboldt Bay in California, Nine Mile Point in New York, plants overseas in Italy, in Germany, Japan, in India, and many others now under design and construction. Nuclear power stations like those symbolize the benefits of safe, clean, economical electric power to people all over the world. As reserves of coal, oil, and gas decrease, nuclear energy provides an increasing portion of mankind's growing need for energy. Steam produced by nuclear reactors also propels submarines and ships months without refueling. Scientists and engineers today are perfecting ways of using nuclear fuel for power supply in space vehicles and eventually for propulsion. Other valuable byproducts of the nation's reactor aside from heat are radiation sources and tagged atoms and radioactive isotopes. Research has revealed that many elements which are not naturally radioactive become so when placed in a nuclear reactor and radiation from these isotopes measured by devices such as the Geiger counter aids the cause of science and serves mankind more and more in many different fields. In agriculture, radiation is now used to preserve food, to eradicate pests, and to test such things as the effect of fertilizers on plant growth and the proper timing for their application, helping to assure bigger and better yields from tomorrow's farms. In industry, radiation has found literally hundreds of new uses. For example, this atomic thickness control of sheet aluminum, saving hundreds of man hours of labor and assuring accuracy never before possible. In the fields of medicine and biochemistry, radiation is performing near miracles. The radioisotope cobalt-60 is used to treat cancer. With radioactive sodium, doctors are learning more about heart disease and circulatory disturbances. Radioactive phosphorus has been used to locate tumors in the brain and greatly simplify operations for their removal. Iodine-131 finds one of many uses in revealing conditions of the thyroid and there are many others. New ways of using radiation are being discovered constantly through the tireless work of modern pioneers in such fields as chemistry, metallurgy, medicine, and biology. Truly the superpower which man first released over two decades ago from within the atom's heart is today man's faithful servant. He is a defender helping maintain peace an engineer providing vast quantities of energy to run the world's machines. He is a farmer helping to better feed the world. Atomic energy is a healer helping to diagnose and cure the sick. And the research worker in the fields of pure science revealing the mysteries of the universe.
Today, they are man's servants, subject to his command, with wisdom, with firmness, and the use of nuclear power. Man is building a brighter future for his children and his children's children in the new world of the atomic age.